I love those words. Thy word, Father, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, hallelujah. Well, this is Ann Windsor, and I'm a disciple of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I'm privileged to share the things of the kingdom of God with you today. Oh, my Lord, I just worship you today and I praise you. Just worship the Lord with me for just a little bit this morning. He is so worthy. He is so worthy of all of our praises and all of our worship. He just gives us life. Well, today I want to share with you uh, something that will encourage you. I haven't been sharing very many testimonies of healing, and I could share some from my own experience, but I wanted to read to you today a message given by Dr. John G. Lake, and some of you may know who John G. Lake is, and some of you may not, but you can do an internet search, Google search on Dr. Lake. He was a minister of the gospel. And he had seen Jesus the healer come into his family's life. And after burying eight brothers and sisters, when Jesus the healer was preached and made known to their family, from that day forward, they never lost another brother or sister to death. The devil tried. He tried to kill Dr. Lake's wife. They called him Dr. Lake, by the way, not because he was a medical doctor, but because he was a spiritual doctor. He ministered healing to the sick through prayer and laying on of hands and saw many people healed. So they came, after so many were healed, they came to start calling him Dr. Lake. (laughs) Um, So he had some tremendous testimonies in his own personal life regarding Jesus the healer. And then the Lord called him to go to South Africa and he did a tremendous work there. Many churches were established And he saw many, many healings and just miraculous things happen because of believing prayer. And Dr. Lake passed away, I believe it was, in maybe 1935 or 1936. So it hasn't even been a 100 years since he's been gone. And he's an example to us of a modern day man who walked in the power of biblical Pentecost. The fire of Pentecost as it was given in the book of Acts. So I just wanted to share a message of his today. Got some testimonies in it and a little scripture reading with some comments by Dr. Lake. This uh, message was given. It's titled, Results of Believing Prayer. And it was given on February the 7th, 1923. Healed Insanity. A woman holding the infant baby of Mrs. Lloyd McLaughlin was asked to stand. Mr. Lake, this baby is just one month old. When the baby was born, the mother was given twilight sleep, which resulted in insanity, as it so often does. This church has been praying for the dear woman. (coughs) On Monday, a group of our people went aside to particularly pray for this dear woman. I called them on the phone about 5 o'clock and asked one of the sisters, What is the answer from heaven? She replied, Well, brother, we have the answer. Our hearts have the victory, and we know the woman is healed. Yesterday morning, the woman awoke healed. Praise the Lord child, helpless and dumb, healed. There was another case I wanted to present at this time, but the mother is delayed. This dear mother comes from Grangerville, Idaho. Her baby was injured in birth due to the child being delivered by instruments. The principal object of instruments these days is the $25 extra that is charged. God 
has had babies born for 5,000 years without any of their accursed use. This little one had the usual thing that takes place in such cases. An injury so terrible that the child was never able to walk or speak. Apparently, it was a partial detachment of the spinal cord from the brain. The mother testifies the baby has begun to walk and talk now. Paralysis in the process of healing. A dear young businessman of the city who has been paralyzed from the neck down for six years is walking now. <clears throat> Healed when totally paralyzed. Some of you will remember Mr. Kelly, who was totally paralyzed from the shoulders down. Himself, his wife, and their new baby were present in the meeting last night, and he testified to his perfect healing. Mrs. Raymond. We have inquiries regarding Mrs. Raymond, who was dying of tuberculosis. Day before yesterday, she was out for three and a half hours for the first time. Her mother says she's healed. She was delivered from very death. Another deliverance. We have a dear mother in Worcester, Massachusetts. Four years ago, her son broke down and went out of his mind. We ministered to him, and the Lord healed him. Recently, almost the same thing has taken place with the daughter. Here is the telegram asking us to pray for her. The daughter is greatly recovered since we prayed for her, but the mother says she still suffers from bad dreams, fear of fire, and fear of death. Reverend Thompson was asked to present this case to the Lord. Scripture reading with comments. Numbers 12. And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. And the Lord heard it. Verses 1 and 2. A great many people lose the blessing that they might have had by sticking their nose into other people's affairs. The Lord has been trying from the very beginning to get folks to learn this truth. This is one of the most severe lessons in the Word of God on the disadvantage of sticking your nose into other people's affairs. The Lord somehow succeeds in looking after most people who put their confidence in Him and regulating them fairly well. You like to be governed by the Spirit of the Lord Himself, and so do I. So we must accord the same privilege to the other party. Verse 3 of Numbers 12. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. No other man in all history had so many reasons to get puffed up if he had been puffable. The little fellow puffs up. The big fellow puffs down. No man ever listened to such words as the Lord spake to Moses. No one was ever dignified by the same commission that God gave to Moses. When God called Moses to his service and sent him to Egypt, he spoke these most startling words to him. Thou shalt be as God. Exodus 4.16 he was endowed with all the authority of God and was sent with the commission to deliver his people from the hands of Pharaoh. His word became the word of God. His action became the action of God. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. X Numbers 12.3 Aaron was the brother and Miriam the sister of Moses. When Moses was called at the burning bush, 
he began to make excuses because of his slowness of speech. And God gave him his brother Aaron, saying, He shall be thy spokesman unto the people. Exodus 4.16 Behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. That's Numbers 12.10 Some time ago, I was called to minister to a leper in the state of Montana, ex-Senator Willits, who had been in confinement several years. It was the first time since leaving Africa that I had a chance to examine a leper with care. So I went with him to his rooms and had him strip. The leprosy was as white as snow. His fingers were dead and swollen three times the normal size. When he would put wood in the fire, he would burn his fingers and would not know it. His feet were in the same condition. He wrote me afterward that the first evidence of healing he noticed was in his toes. The color and feeling returned. In verses 10 to 13, again, of Numbers, The cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Moses' prayer is characteristic of so many of the prayers of the Bible. It is brief. It contains only eight words. Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. But with Aaron's wholehearted confession, the heart of Moses was moved even as the heart of God. I want to talk to you a little about this subject of prayer. It seems to me that this prayer of Moses is a wonderful example of that remarkable teaching of Jesus on the subject of faith in the 11th chapter of Mark. After the cursing of the fig tree, Jesus utilized the instance to give voice to his marvelous teaching of faith in God. He said, Verily, verily, when an Oriental used the words, Verily, verily, he raised his hand, and it gave it the solemnity of an oath. With the solemnity of an oath I say unto you, What things? Soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. Mark 11, 23 and 24. The revised version gives it greater force. When you pray, believe that you have received. When? Why bless your soul? When you pray. Mrs. Ferguson, will you kindly stand? woman stands. A week ago, Saturday, Brother Wiggins, Brother Dugan, Mrs. Lake, and I were just leaving the heating rooms on our way to Forest Grove, Oregon, when a gentleman came in and told us of this woman's suffering and begged us to come. We went, knelt by her bedside, laid hands on the woman, and in one minute the Lord delivered her. I put my fingers into her side, holding the appendix between my fingers to demonstrate the perfectness of the healing. Observing how the Lord had touched her body, she said, Brother, I want to give my heart to God. So we called in her sons and the other man, a cousin, and our sister gave herself to the Lord. 
Last Sunday, she became a member of the church and today is present to give public thanks to God for her salvation and healing. When you pray, believe that you receive and you shall have, or believe that you have received. You have it. That is what it means. We used to have a little Englishman in our evangelistic party who would say to the people when they were praying, Now, let us stop praying for five minutes and believe God and see what will happen. It was perfectly amazing the wonderful things that will happen when people believe God. There is an attitude of faith, an opening of the soul to God, a divine laying hold in the spirit. I can imagine the soul cry in the prayer of Moses under these circumstances. Miriam, his own sister, now smitten and leprous, white as snow. What were the feelings of his heart? I sometimes have thought that there is no circumstance in my own life that ever called out so much faith in God and determination of soul to see God's will done as in the healing of a sister. One of my sisters and I had been chums from our childhood. She was a little older than I. The vision of Christ as the healer had just opened to my soul. She was dying of an issue of blood. My mother called me one night and said, John, if you want to see your sister alive, you must come at once. When I arrived, my mother said, you are too late. She is gone. I stepped to her bedside and laid my hand on her forehead. It was cold and dead. I slipped my hand down over her heart and the heart had ceased to beat. I picked up a small mirror and held it over her mouth, but there was no discoloration. The breath was gone. I stood there stunned. Her husband knelt at the foot of the bed weeping, her baby asleep in a crib on the opposite side of the room. My old father and mother knelt sobbing at the side of the bed. They had seen eight of their children die, and she apparently was the ninth. My soul was in a storm. Just a few weeks before, my wife was healed when she almost died. Just a few weeks before, my brother had been healed after being an invalid for 22 years. A short time before, my older sister with five cancers in the breast, who had been operated on five times and turned away to die, was healed. As I looked at my sister, I said, God, this is not the will of God, and I cannot accept it. It is the will of the devil and darkness, he that hath the power of death that is the devil. I discovered this fact, that there are times when your spirit lays hold of the spirit of another, and they just cannot get away from you. Somehow, I just felt my spirit lay hold of the spirit of that woman, and I prayed, Dear Lord, she just cannot go. I walked up and down for some time. My spirit was crying out for somebody with faith in God that I could call, call on to help me. That was 25 years ago when the individual who trusted God for healing was almost insane in the mind of the church and the world. 
Bless God, it is different now. That is the advantage of having people who trust God and walk out on God's lines. They come together and stay together, put their hands and hearts together and carry one another's load and form a nucleus in society which has some force for God. I have no confidence or faith in these little efforts that people run after here and there. Most of them go up in vapor. If you want something done for God and humanity, put your hearts and your hands together and your souls together. Organize your efforts. That baby's mother, referring to the baby in the audience, would not have been healed, except that a little nucleus determined to pray until the woman was healed, and they stayed in prayer all day Monday. At five o'clock, they had the victory. It took them all day. I wish we had spirituality and faith enough to look through the mists and see what was taking place all that day long until the powers of darkness were dispelled and the healing came. As I walked up and down in my sister's room, I could think of but one man that had faith on this line. That was John Alexander Dowie, 600 miles away. I went to the phone and called Western Union and told them I wanted to get a telegram through to Mr. Dowie and then answer back as quickly as possible. I sent this wire. My sister has apparently died, but my spirit will not let her go. I believe if you will pray, God will heal her. I received this message back. Hold on to God. I am praying. She will live. Oh, God, I have said a thousand times, what would it have meant if instead of that telegram of faith, I had received one from a weakling preacher who might have said, I am afraid you are on the wrong track, or brother, you are excited, or the days of miracles are past. It was the strength of his faith that came over the wire that caused the lightnings of my soul to begin to flash. And while I stood there at the telephone and listened, the very lightnings of God began to flash in my spirit. I prayed, This thing of hell cannot be, and it will not be. In the name of Jesus Christ, I abolish death and sickness, and she shall live. And as I finished praying, I turned my eyes toward the bed, and I saw her eyelid blink. But I was so wrought up, I said, maybe I deceived myself. So I stood a little while at the telephone, and the lightnings of God's Spirit were still flashing from my soul. Presently, I observed her husband get up and tiptoe to her head, and I knew he had seen it. I said, What is it, Peter? He replied, I thought I saw her eyelids move. And just then, they moved again. Five days later, she came to Father's home, and the Lake family sat down to Christmas dinner, the first time in their lives when they were all well. Beloved, it was not our long prayers, but believing God that gets the answer. However, I want to help somebody who finds persistent prayer a necessity, as we all do sometimes. We have not the least idea, Paul says, of the powers of darkness we are praying against. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.12 And sometimes you have to lay hold of God and stay before God and stay through the blackness and through the darkness and through the night of it until the faith of God penetrates, bless God, and the work is done. 
Do you remember the experience of Daniel, one of the finest in the book? He had to hear from heaven. He fasted and prayed for 21 days. And on the 21st day, an angel came to him right out of heaven. And the angel said, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, from the first day thy prayer was heard. Not the last time you prayed, but the very first. Daniel ten eleven to 14. O oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. And I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. Michael is spoken of again as the warrior angel. He made way against the devil and cast him out of heaven. Get the circumstance. Daniel had prayed and God heard his prayer and answered it by sending an angel messenger. But the messenger himself was held up on the way by some other power of darkness until reinforcements came and God dispatched Michael, one of the chief angels, to his help. I wonder what was necessary to be accomplished in the minds of those interested before God could answer that prayer. You are praying for somebody. You are praying for your friend or your brother, or your son, or your daughter, who needs your love and faith. Beloved, have you faith in God to stay and pray until the Spirit has the chance to work out the problem? That is the issue. Keep right down to it. Do not let go. It is the will of God, and you have a right to an answer. There is a ministry of intercession that comes from heaven. Oh, it is prayer by the Spirit of God. It is entering into the prayer spirit of the Holy Ghost. He prays. He prays for you. He prays for me with groanings that cannot be uttered. Romans 8.26 Our spirit in union with His We enter into oneness of faith, reaching out into the ether of God and the love of His Spirit and taking that power of God and fashioning the power of God into the soul's desire. A lot of folks stop when halfway through. You hold on to God and pray through. Then there are times like the one when my sister was restored, when the faith and power of God comes like the lightning flash, and to Moses when he prayed, Hear her now, O God, I beseech thee, and the healing was instant. There are times when it is only your humanity that prays. You know these times yourself, when your soul does not enter into your prayer much less your spirit. There are times when your soul prays. People these days do not even have much conception of the realm of the soul or the psyche. Then there is a prayer in the spirit, that deeper quality of your life, deeper than the psyche or soul. Oh, bless God, there is still a prayer where the spirit of man and the spirit of God Unite and become one. No one can imagine, as Moses prayed that day, how his soul must have been stirred. Here is his own sister, the woman who had stood by the riverside when he was a babe and had put him in a basket, hid him in the bulrushes, 
and watched over his welfare. Don't you think she was interested in him? Sometimes I have sympathized with Miriam. She had a sisterly and motherly affection for Moses. She wanted to keep him straight. She was afraid he had made a great mistake in his marriage. Say, beloved, you are a father probably, or you are a mother, or a sister or brother, and you have laid hold so tightly on the other one that you are afraid to leave them in the hands of God. That is one of the hardest things folks have to learn, to just take their hands off the other and let God have them. There is no record that God had any quarrel with Moses about his wife. Stephen Merritt was a godly old undertaker in the city of New York. His dear old wife and he lived a godly life. They had raised one son, and if there was ever a reprobate, it was that son, Charlie. Charlie would get into some disreputable affair, and the police would come and say, Charlie has done so-and-so. It will take so much money to get him out of the difficulty. The next week, another would come along with something else, and so it went, on and on. And the two old gray heads were praying and pouring out their tears for that boy's salvation. Stephen Merritt had a habit of receiving people into his office and helping them. John G. Woolley was one that he often helped. He handed Woolley five dollars and said, You meet me at such and such campground. Woolley was a drunkard. He had not been accustomed to being trusted with money. And he met the old man there and found God. One day, as he sat in his office, he was praying about his son, and the floor was wet with his tears. When he heard the voice of God saying, How long have you been trying to save Charlie? So many of us are, quote, trying to save Charlie, and we have gotten in the way of the Lord. He replied, Lord, a long time. The Lord said, now, if you are through, I will undertake. The old man considered, and it worked out in his soul this way. The police came and said, Charlie did so and so. He asked, Who is Charlie? Why, he is your son. No, I have no son, Charlie. That day, as he knelt there, he said, Lord, he is not my son any more. I give him over to you until he is saved. So he told the police, No, I have no son. They looked at him and shook their heads. Then they sent another officer. But it was no use to go to him any more. It looked as if the old man had gone crazy. About nine months passed, and one day an officer came and said, Charlie has jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge and finished. He wanted the old man to have the river dragged to obtain the body. But he said, Oh no, I have no son. Drag the river if you want to. So they dragged the river, but the body they found was not Charlie's. Three months more passed, and one day a clerk said, There is one of your friends in the office. And when he came in, it was Charlie. He was beautifully dressed, clean-faced, everything indicating the light of God. And when the old father came in, the son fell at his feet, kissed them, and asked his forgiveness. He said in explanation, Three months ago I was saved in a mission, but I, I did not want to come and see you until I came as a man. Not only is it so in your prayers for others, but in your prayers for yourself. Some of you are holding to your sickness or difficulty with such a clutch and are so everlastingly conscious of it that God cannot get it out of your hands. You are in the very place spiritually where old Stephen Merritt was. 
He was so determined to save his boy that he was just doing it himself, and God was not getting a chance. Open your hands. Let go of the old difficulty. I was praying for a woman who had appendicitis. And as I prayed, I saw she was holding on to it mentally so hard I had to do something. So I told one of the craziest stories I ever told. And finally, she burst out laughing in spite of the pain. And when she got through, the pain was gone. She just opened her clutch. Maybe you're holding on to sin with that same clutch. Maybe you are holding on to disobedience to God with that same clutch. Maybe it is your sickness. If there is something that is keeping you from being blessed, let clear go and let your hands and heart open. When I was a boy, I used to visit the Sioux Locks at St. Marie, Michigan. Sioux St. Marie, Michigan, where my home was. One day, a Savior was up in the Mass. He lost his balance, shot over the ship into the water. Another sailor stood on the railing of the ship and watched him. He went down and came up and went down and came up again, and everything was in a foam around him. Still the fellow stood there. Then the champ, chap went down the third time, limp. And just as he was disappearing, he shot down into the water and came up with him. A couple of gentlemen were standing by, and one remarked, That fellow has taken men out of the water before. He just waited until the kick was all out of him. Otherwise, both might have drowned. A lot of us have to thresh and struggle and fight until the kick is all out of us before we are ready to let God take us. As a young fellow, I was proud as Lucifer. Every lake I ever knew was. Robert Burns wrote with his diamond on the window of a Highland Inn. There is nothing here but Highland pride, Highland pride and poverty. It did not make any difference how poor they were. The hardest thing I had to do was to make my surrender to God. I heard Riley tell the other night of having been a dope fiend and gambler and of how God had saved him. I never knew anything about that kind of life, never touched whiskey in my life, never used tobacco, never committed an unholy act in the moral sense, but that proud heart of mine had to struggle like a drowning man until I was ready to say, Lord, you save me. The final consummation came when I knelt behind an old elm tree and poured out my heart to God and made my surrender to him. The light of heaven broke into my soul, and I arose from my knees, a son of God, and I knew it. Let God have you. Quit sweating. Quit wrestling about the most difficult class in the world to get healed is Christian scientists. Why? Because they are working at it so hard. They have been reading so many lessons and concentrating their mind on healing until almost exhausted. You have to lead them away from it all to that place where, quote, it is not try, but trust. That is the secret of Christ's healing. That is the secret of Christ's salvation. It is trusting him for it and believing him when he says he will do it. And the mind relaxes and the soul comes to rest. There is a wonderful help in disarming people. I read a story of the healing of Sam Leakey He had become a most notorious drunkard. He bought whiskey and buried it until he filled his whole lot with buried whiskey. It was a mania. Everybody who tried to help him would say, 
Leaky, just make one promise that you will not drink anymore. Finally, he went to a woman who was wiser than the others. Before he went out of the room, he said, She said, I want you to promise me one thing. He said, I will promise you anything except that I will not drink whiskey. I'm nearly crazy for a drink now. She said, I want you to promise that every time you feel like taking a drink of whiskey, you will do so. Sure I will. Do you get the secret of that? She disarmed him right away. The thing he was clutching all the time was the fear that someone was going to make him promise not to drink whiskey. One morning, when he awoke, he discovered that the cursed appetite was gone. Say, dear hearts, let go. Open your clutch. Let God take you. Let God have you, whether it is for your spirit, whether it is for your soul, whether it is for your body. No matter what, just let go. It is not try, but trust. God bless you. The nearer the soul is to God, the less its perturbations. As the point nearest the center of a circle is subject to the least motion. For he that is entered into his rest He also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Hebrews 4.11 Let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. Have you entered that rest? Hallelujah. Well, there were many good testimonies in here. Healings, testimonies of healings. Accounts of believing by faith for the salvation of your loved ones. Exhortations to let go of things that you may be unconsciously clutching that are keeping you from being healed or being saved or moving into the next thing that God has for your life. I just encourage you to go back and listen to this message again. And again, because each time the Holy Spirit will quicken a different part of it to you. Or he may take one certain part and emphasize it to you over and over again. Because he wants that one thing to become a habit of life for you. Hallelujah. I know that we're at a time in our country and in our world when there is no rest and people's lives are losing their rest more and more and more they may sleep at night but they don't get any rest they don't awake rested because of the tribulations that there are in this world right now but Jesus said that he wants to send us forth as laborers into the harvest field times of unrest our opportunities for bringing in a great harvest. Hallelujah. So just lift up your eyes and begin to look at the people around you and ask the Lord what you can do for them to minister His peace and His salvation, His preservation, His provision, and His protection into their lives. Again, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, just Pray this prayer with me today and receive him into your life. Lord Jesus, I come to you right now and I acknowledge that I have sinned against you and against heaven. I believe that you came to the earth and became a man and that you died on the cross as the payment for my sins against heaven. Thank you, Lord, 
that by your blood that payment has been made and my slate, my account with heaven has been settled. And right now, I receive what you did for me. I received the forgiveness that is in my account for me. I thank you that though my sins were like scarlet because of your blood, they are made white as snow. Thank you, Lord, you put in me a new heart and create in me a right spirit. Jesus, I open the door of my heart, my inward being. I invite you to come in and make your home in me. And I thank you that you said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I know that you do not lie. So I have called, and now I believe that you have come in, you have cleansed me, and I am saved. Thank you that my name is written in heaven. I rise up from this place, Lord, to walk as your disciple.